Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dane Menke. I am the Digital Marketing Manager here at Regenesis and Land Science. Before we get started with the webinar today, I have just a couple of administrative items to cover. Since we're trying to keep this under an hour, today's presentation will be conducted with the audience audio settings on mute. This will minimize unwanted background noise from the large number of participants joining us today. If you have a question, we encourage you to ask it using the question feature located on the webinar panel. We'll collect your questions and do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. If we do not address your question, we'll make an effort to follow up with you after the webinar. We are recording this webinar, and a link to the recording will be emailed to you once it is available. In order to continue to sponsor events that are of value and worthy of your time, we'll be sending out a brief survey following the webinar to get your feedback. Today's webinar will focus on the evolution of vapor barrier technology and best practices for successful vapor barrier implementation. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. We are pleased to have with us Scott Wilson, President and CEO of Regenesis and Land Science. Scott has extensive experience in the development and application of advanced technologies for groundwater and soil restoration and vapor intrusion mitigation. He is a widely published expert with over 30 years experience designing, installing, and operating a broad range of remediation technologies. He has expertise in project management and has directed the successful completion of large industrial remediation programs under state and federal regulatory frameworks. At Regenesis and Land Science on specific projects, he plays an active role in technical oversight and program management to ensure conformance with customer expectations. We're also pleased to have with us today, Ryan Miller, East Region Manager for Land Science. Ryan's role includes providing technical support in the design and installation of TerraShield, NitroSeal, MonoShield, and RetroCoat vapor mitigation systems, and educating the environmental community on advancements in vapor intrusion barrier technology, implementation, and quality control. Ryan has extensive experience in the environmental consulting industry, most recently working on brownfield redevelopment projects and specializing in vapor intrusion mitigation. All right, that concludes our introduction. So now I will hand things over to Scott Wilson to get us started. Thanks very much, Dane. Well, uh, the good folks at the Land Science Division have asked me to uh, give sort of a thumbnail of the history of contaminant vapor barriers and the evolution of materials. So I'll, I'll start with, with speaking about why the need for vapor barriers. And it really emerged in, in the 2000s when uh, when the EPA and state regulatory uh, reg, uh, regulators actually started to embrace risk-based corrective action. That is, they started to realize that not every site had to be cleaned up to kindergarten safe. For instance, if an office building was to be put onto a site that was contaminated, no one's going to drink the water or eat the soil. So they were allowing some contamination to be left on those facilities or those sites. However, it, it, it shortly became apparent that while they didn't have to clean up the soil and groundwater, that you couldn't put a building on top of a, a plume and allow for vapors to migrate into the, into the building and impact the inhabitants. So therefore, vapor intrusion became an issue. And that was really in, 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 the, in the early 2000s. And the first response to this was the use of water vapor barriers. And if, for instance, if even today, if you were to Google the word vapor barrier, what you'll find is up, up, up will come all sorts of advertisements for thin mill sheets and, and tape seamed type products. These are actually used in construction to stop water vapor from coming into foundations or, or concrete uh, uh, subterranean structures. Very common to use that just to keep water out. Those are not contaminant vapors uh, barriers. Those are just simply water vapor barriers. The problem with using these became apparent when the VOCs, the volatile organic contaminants such as benzene, such as gasoline, such as chlorinated solvents, they actually dissolve the adhesive on the tape. And, and you start to see gaping holes that are, that are just straight pathways for contaminants to migrate along uh, penetrations and so forth. So the use of tape seams and thin mill sheets really wasn't appropriate. Uh, and, and the response to that was, that, that we began to see in the early and, and mid 2000s, the use of booting sprays. Now the term boot 
with booting is is used in the waterproofing industry mostly with regard to like uh, basements when when people construct a basement they'll boot it and that means that they'll they'll, they'll spray it with a pitch or or an oil based material and we started to see these booting sprays used on ground before a foundation's poured that is to say that people were just spraying this this the, the black it's styrene butadiene rubber right onto the ground and, and, and pouring concrete on it and claiming that that was going to stop these VOCs from, from entering into the concrete. Uh, sometimes it was sprayed directly on, on the dirt. Sometimes it was sprayed onto a scrim or a mesh, which is like a, a net, a plastic net of material. Well, and here you see a gentleman spraying onto a, onto a, a scrim. Uh, these are these are great. This technology was great at sealing slab penetrations. In other words, these pipes, for instance, that are sticking up, it's great for sealing around those pipes and for for giving some thickness to to uh, to the to the barrier material itself because you can build it up to fairly thick, and it will do a great job at repelling water. But the problem with this is it will sorb contaminants directly into the material. Remember that from, from Chemistry 101, like dissolves like. If you want to dissolve an oil, you, you, you use an oil-based solvent. If you want to dissolve a, a water-based material, you use water. So a hydrophobic material will not dissolve uh, the, the VOCs. In fact, it will, I'm sorry, the hydrophobic material will not dissolve water. It'll actually repel the water. It does a great job of being a waterproofing material. But the same material, when confronted with VOCs, doesn't repel them. It actually sorbs them up. And so we were seeing these waterproofing materials used as vapor barriers beginning in, I'd say, the mid-2000s. Well, we, we at Regenesis, we, we recognized that this was an issue and that, that while it was starting to be a, a, a approved for these, these technologies, were, these waterproofing materials were being approved or contaminant vapor barriers, it was inappropriate. So we realized that, that, that if you put down a protective layer first, say high density polyethylene, that it would do a good job of protecting that SBR rubber spray. So we started to look at HDPE and we actually found a supplier of composite waterproofing membranes that, that, that had a composite that they were using for waterproofing. And we took that and we adapted it for the use as a contaminant vapor barrier. And by, by, by adapting it, what I mean is we did all the testing to show that by having that HDPE down first, that high density polyethylene, it was doing a, a reasonable job of protecting the SBR. We then also developed all the, uh, the details required for vapor barrier application in terms of engineering. This is actually a diagram of some of the the equipment that we had to develop on our own to test. There was no testing available for, for vape, uh, contaminant vapor intrusion. Uh, and so we adapted PPE testing, uh, per, uh, personal protective equipment testing methods, uh, and, and, uh, and measured the, the efficiency of this at, at reducing diffusion. But all of that, we, we had to do all that work in, in developing this. We launched it as GeoSeal. And, and uh, the composite was really a thin HDPE base. That's the blue material there. And that, that five mil HDPE served to protect the middle layer somewhat from, from gases building up in that middle styrene butadiene asphalt core material in the middle. That's that spray. And then on top, we put a thin HDPE sheet. And we called it GeoSeal. We actually launched this in 2007, I believe it was. And uh, it, it was received by the industry as a big improvement. Uh, compared to spraying just uh, SBR rubber on the ground, having that HDPE below it served to protect it somewhat. And it was considered sort of state of the art in 2007. But over the years of 2008, say to, I don't know, around 2015, it was apparent to us that there were some real limitations and shortcomings of taking simple waterproofing materials and adapting them as contaminant vapor barriers. Um, and to be very frank with you, the, 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 the main 
the main consideration is that we're not trying to block water. We're trying to block VOCs. And when you have VOCs, volatile organic contaminants under buildings, it is a serious matter. Uh, VOCs behave nothing like water vapors. Again, going back to the like dissolves like, waterproofing materials repel water, but they do not repel. Most waterproofing materials, simple waterproofing materials like SBR rubber, they do not repel VOCs. And volatile organic contaminants, they're insidious. Uh, these, these materials will actually diffuse across even HDPE. And tiny amounts diffusing across over time presents a chronic exposure of those contaminants to the people in the building. And, and this is a serious matter. Over time, it can, you, know, you can develop sick building syndromes, illnesses within the building, et cetera. It's not waterproofing. It's, it's vapor, VOC vapor barriers we're talking about. So we took this very seriously and started to look at, the, you know, the primary concern with, with these waterproofing materials is long-term chemical resistance. And this thin layer of HDPE that we put down, it was, was a big advancement over having nothing at all. It's really only a modest level of protection. It can become saturated with VOCs and those gases then can pass into that middle layer. And then that middle layer, as I mentioned, sorbs that, that SBR rubber asphalt, that sorbs contaminants, and they will, if, if in the right circumstances and left to time, they can, they can move across that barrier, across the top sheet and into the concrete above. And here's a, let me just give you a, a little demonstration here. This is a short video. Uh, just to give you a, an, a, an example or a, a look at, at, at the barrier. Here's the white is the HDPE, and you see contamination coming up below, slowly permeating that, that lower barrier and getting into the middle layer, building up and saturating it, and then it starts to bleed across the top. We call this diffusion. It's, it's diffusion of the VOCs, and over time, given concentrations below, we call those challenge concentrations of the gas below, it will in fact impact the HDP, build up in the middle layer and then bleed across the top if left over time with these challenge gases. By 2015, we realized it was time to develop a true contaminant vapor barrier. Instead of simply, adapt, simply adapting and trying to protect these, these waterproofing materials, let's, let's develop a barrier from scratch. What would we do? You know, in 2007, GeoSeal was truly state of the art. By 2015, there were totally new materials available. And our R&D team saw a way to develop a much more protective barrier system. So I just want to take a moment now and, 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 and digress a little bit and, and, and talk about parallels in other industries. And when I think about safety and the evolution of safety, I, I, I think about the, the auto industry. And if you look at the auto industry and, and what safety, with safety uh, appliances were used in the auto industry. Back in the 1970s, two-point seat belts, the lap belts, just the, the click lap belts, were state-of-the-art safety equipment. And, you know, the, the big auto manufacturers held their head high when they sold these cars because they had the state-of-the-art safety equipment in it, lap belts and maybe headrests. But by the early 1990s, no cars were sold with simple lap belts. There were self-restraint systems, there were crumple zones, there were collapsible steering columns. All of that had evolved. And then by the year 2000, all cars had airbags. Today, if a dealer were to sell a car, you know, uh, to get the price down was to sell a car with just a lap belt, that would be considered incredibly unethical because you would be exposing people to to the potential for collisions and, and, and bodily damage. And auto manufacturers would never have it because of the liability to them. I think we're moving into a similar situation where these waterproofing materials uh, you know, are simply outdated. So we spent five years of research and development looking at what is a better spray that we could use instead of SBR rubber. And we developed the first ever nitrile asphalt spray membrane. 
And if you're not familiar with, with nitrile, nitrile is the blue material that you see in gloves used throughout the hazardous material industry. Even car mechanics use the blue nitrile gloves. And that's because uh, latex, uh, even synthetic latexes like SBR, exposed to solvents, industrial solvents and gasoline, they'll dissolve. So, it, so by using nitrile and, and incorporating that into a spray, we have significantly improved, improved the chemical resistance of these membranes. You see up to 10 times less diffusion across those membranes when we use our, our, our nitrile uh, advanced spray. The other thing that, that it's just, it's just a, a, a real breakthrough is these materials clean up with soap and water. Our nitrile, we, we, you can clean it up with simple warm soap and water. Currently, if you're using these waterproofing materials as a vapor barrier, the applicators are using diesel, a naphthalene containing diesel fuel to, to, to clean their equipment and spray. So all of that can be avoided with, with the use of this nitrile. The other thing that we really focused on, well, before I get there, let me show you this. Here's, here's some data that actually shows nitrile advanced uh, asphalt latex versus generic styrene butadiene rubber, which is used in GeoSeal, for example. What we've done here is this is an accelerated test to get the diffusion constants across the membranes. And what we do is we put a high concentration challenge gas over a short period of time. And this isn't, uh, this isn't our data, but, but it generated elsewhere. But what you see here is you see you know, around 10 times better resistance to permeation and diffusion of the gas when you use the nitrile advanced asphalt versus generic. And, and uh, these are the slopes that are used to generate the, uh, uh, the, the diffusion constants. So much, much better performance. The other thing we focused on was aluminized films. And now intuitively you all know that aluminized films are much better than, 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 than other rubber latexes. Think about mylar balloons. The shiny mylar balloons are actually an aluminized film. Think about how they hold up compared to regular balloons, which is either a synthetic uh, SBR or EDPM or, or, uh, or, or late, uh, natural latex. Those balloons lose air uh, very shortly, whereas the mylar stays up for a very long period of time. And it's because Aluminum just doesn't pass gas uh, well. It doesn't allow for those gases to cross. These metallized film offer much greater protection against VOCs. And what we've done is we've developed specific film technology utilizing aluminum and bringing it to the contaminant vapor barrier market. And these offer at least 100 times better protection than, than, uh, than HDPE. If you take a, a, a sheet of HDPE and, and twice as thick as what we use in GeoSeal and compare it to the aluminum, the, this aluminum sheet is still a hundred times better than, than twice as thick HDPE than, as what's being used currently. I also want to mention that, 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 that you know, we've studied this, we've studied this in, in multiple ways and corrosion is not a problem. Uh, the, the, these materials are, the aluminum is completely encapsulated within uh, polyethylene and uh, it has a hydrophobic material sprayed on top. And when you look at the performance, this is the, the blue line at the bottom. This is actually done at Applied Geo Kinetics Lab, which is a, a nationwide recognized lab for, for contaminant vapor, vapor barrier testing. And compared to our GeoSeal product, it's, it's night and day. Uh, the GeoSeal was allowing a certain amount of gas to cross over time. And, and even under these, uh, these severe conditions used to derive rate constants, the mono shield, which is, a, which is the, the aluminum containing sheet, just showed, showed no diffusion at all. So night and day when we use our aluminum technology and nitrile versus uh, simple waterproofing materials. So, I'm running out of time here, but, but in short, the new state of the art in terms of materials for vapor barriers are using nitrile containing spray materials to seal around penetrations and metallized films. And these are both the, the key components of our, of our uh, line of vapor barrier technologies, which is nitroseal, monoshield, and terashield. And you know, adapting waterproofing materials simply simply isn't appropriate. It, it, uh, in the long run, uh, there's a real concern with 
with long-term exposure and chemical resistance. And as a result, we, we will no longer be supplying GeoSeal as a vapor intrusion barrier. It, it's just been, been obsoleted by the use of these higher tech materials of nitrile and aluminum. So in summary, summarizing the contaminant vapor evolution, uh, back in 2000, when risk-based closure actions uh, let, were leaving contamination in the ground, uh, and it was deemed necessary to stop vapors from entering the buildings that were constructed on those properties, we first saw waterproofing materials uh, and, and, and uh, water vapor materials, such as plastic sheets with tape seams and simple booting materials that were sprayed on the ground. Uh, Regenesis recognized the incompatibility of those materials with volatile organic contaminants that we were trying to block. And uh, we brought to market the first contaminant uh, vapor barrier that was made of composite waterproofing materials, and it was GeoSeal. And that product was state-of-the-art back in 2007. But by about 2015, we recognized the shortcomings of using these waterproofing products and the susceptibility for potential breakthrough from volatile organic contaminants. And we, we, we then started to work with nitrile and aluminum films, and we've come up with a, a product line that, that incorporates these very, very protective materials. Uh, and the product line offers orders of magnitude more protection than uh, the composite waterproofing systems of the past. And uh, so far in, in the past, say, two years or so, we've put down over 5 million square feet of these products and they've been very well received by the industry. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan Miller, who will uh, lead us on a, on a talk of, of construction of vapor barriers and best practices. Thanks, Scott. That was really great information. So I'm going to be transitioning the conversation from vapor barrier evolution and chemical resistance testing to best practices and construction considerations for vapor barrier installations. So as a way of a brief background, I know Scott touched on this, but Land Science is a recognized industry leader in vapor intrusion mitigation. We have a team positioned across the U.S. to provide local support to engineering firms, regulators, property owners to ensure we're offering the safest, most technically sound and most cost-effective solutions. In addition, we're constantly working with our team of certified applicators to ensure every vapor barrier application is a high quality installation. Our entire focus at Land Science is really built, is to build and implement the absolute best vapor barrier solutions in the environmental marketplace. And to do that, we offer a full suite of VI technologies to ensure the right solution is selected for your project. In addition, we can provide design assistance on any project, along with a certified installation, proper QA, QC procedures, all of which I'll discuss in more detail in the coming slides. So as Scott just discussed, Land Science now offers three vapor barrier technologies, TerraShield, MonoShield, and NitroSeal. And this was done for a very specific reason, because one size does not fit all. Each site you work on is unique and selecting a vapor mitigation that properly fits that site is absolutely key to finding a remedy that is protective and cost effective. But to begin, I'll discuss the evaluation criteria of vapor barriers in general. Contaminant vapor barriers are often evaluated by two primary criteria, chemical resistance, right, the ability to block vapors, and then what we call constructability, meaning how easily is that barrier installed, or more importantly, the quality of the installation. It's really the combination of these two factors that often determine which barrier is selected for any given project. Now, there's certainly a third criteria that's not shown, and that's cost, which of course is always an important factor. I will note here that land science vapor barriers are priced competitively in the marketplace. But for today, I really want to focus on constructability. Before I do move to constructability, I, I will reiterate what Scott discussed regarding chemical resistance because it's it's really really important aspect of evaluating vapor barriers, and it's something regulators, design engineers, consultants often look at first. But as I hope to outline in the following slides, this is only half the evaluation process because constructability of the vapor barrier is equally as important. 
So we often say you can have the most chemically resistant vapor barrier in the world, but if it can't be installed in a timely manner or the seams or utility penetrations can't be sealed properly, then what good is it really? Um, when it comes to constructability, we look at three areas, which I'll further expand on, but first the speed of the vapor barrier installation, meaning can it be installed efficiently? Second, the durability of the vapor barrier. Can it withstand an active construction site? And third, a certified installation, meaning is the vapor barrier installed by a contractor that has experience doing this work? Or is it installed by a contractor who's seen this type of work for the first time? In addition, in, in our experience, an often overlooked consideration when evaluating vapor barriers is the site's building type. Foundation elements such as grade beams, thick and slab areas, footers, elevation changes, split wall foundations, and particularly the frequency of utility penetrations, which are commonly clustered and dispersed across the foundation, can all influence how efficient, how costly, and how effective the vapor barrier installation is. As an example, look at the photo on the right. So this warehouse application is slab on grade construction, contains minimal utility penetrations, really making it ideal for a single layer spray applied seam vapor barrier like MonoShield. Now, if you compare it to a project like this one, which is a residential townhome project that contains numerous utility penetrations, elevation changes, the requirement for the vapor barrier installation will be very different. And this doesn't even begin to evaluate what the site contaminants are. So this type of application is ideal for a three-layer composite vapor barrier system like Terrace Shield or NitroSeal that can be installed quickly but effectively around those utility penetrations, interior footings, and perimeter terminations. So when it comes to constructability, the first area I want to touch on is the installation speed, because the old adage is time is money. So installing a vapor barrier is really no different. But what actually impacts that installation of a vapor barrier? For starters, the actual production rate of installing the vapor barrier. So this may seem like common sense, but look at the pictures on the right side and the time it would take to seal the seams using these two different methods. The top shows the installation of mono shield using a nitrile advanced asphalt latex. And the bottom shows a tape system with seams being sealed by someone on their hands and knees. Now multiply this by 100,000, 300,000, 500,000 square feet, and the time to install different vapor barriers can be substantially different. Next, weather. As some of you know, I'm, I'm based here in the Northeast, so that means I contend with winter weather conditions for a large chunk of the year. Perhaps your projects are located where it rains often. Contending with weather is something that is also often overlooked. But having the right vapor barrier system can greatly impact installation time. I'd highly recommend actually reviewing the weather requirements when evaluating vapor barriers because trying to tape seams together in the cold or rain can be very difficult. And I know two-sided tape and similar products work conceptually, but implementing them in the field, especially under poor weather conditions can be an entirely different thing. Also QA, QC procedures can impact the speed in which the vapor barrier is installed. So when I say QA, QC procedures, there are really a number of things that fall underneath that umbrella, but one of the most important QA, QC procedures is a smoke test. And smoke testing is used to determine if the vapor barrier was installed properly by pumping smoke underneath the vapor barrier to see if any areas such as seams, utility penetrations, perimeter terminations are sealed vapor tight. So getting a proper seal around those locations in an efficient manner can really, really reduce the time needed in the field. And finally, consideration for what the project's construction activities will be. How many concrete slab pours will there be? What equipment is needed? Will they be driving on the vapor barrier using a laser screed? What about rebar placement? So the actual sequencing of a lot of these events can play a role in the speed of the installation. So here's a photo of a monoshield installation that took place earlier this year. 
which I hope captures some of the components of what I just discussed. The photo was taken on an evening in January located here in the Northeast. So weather, uh, winter weather certainly played a, a factor, but even with some of these conditions, the applicator was installing monoshield at a rate of over 35,000 square feet per day and having no issues getting a seal on the seams that you see in that picture. And this is due in great part to our nitrile advanced asphalt latex, which Scott did a great job outlining the benefits of. But another benefit is that it can be sprayed in various weather conditions, including colder temperatures. And I'll say this photo also shows the level of construction activities that can take place on top of the barrier. Um, and another side note here, in good weather conditions, our applicator's production rate can be even greater than the 35,000 square feet per day. So the second consideration I mentioned is the durability of the vapor barrier. And I think highlighting what goes into the durability of a vapor barrier is incredibly important. So to start the thickness of a barrier, and a lot of times people equate thickness to chemical resistance, which in theory can be true, but the thickness of a barrier also matters when it comes to protection from construction related activities. So EPA in 2008 document recommended a minimum thickness of 30 mil, which all land science vapor barriers do meet. So it's certainly something to keep in mind as anything less than 30 mil thickness may actually not even hold up to the construction activities of the site. And so one of the reasons our vapor barriers hold up to heavy construction activities is the incorporation of a geotextile fabric on the underside of the barrier. So this added protection allows for a wider range of subgrade options as larger stone can actually damage thinner taped vapor barrier systems. And also adding to the durability of the vapor barrier is the nitrile advanced asphalt latex, which strengthens the vapor barrier, um, as I'll demonstrate in this following example. So, as I said, a, an example of how far the advancement has come with our nitrile advanced asphalt latex and why seam durability is so important. Here's a picture of a monoshield installation from late last year. So on this project, 100,000 square feet of monoshield was installed one day prior to the concrete pour. That night, we had a pretty bad storm come through and it blew the barrier not only out of place, but the storm actually twisted the vapor barrier up like a corkscrew. And this picture doesn't even do justice to how bad the storm was. At first, it was thought this entire 100,000 square feet would need to be reinstalled, which would have cost everyone involved a lot of time and money to get new materials, man hours to reinstall the vapor barrier, delays to the concrete pour, and ultimately delays to the project. As it turned out, none of that ended up being true. As you can see here, the vapor barrier was untwisted and pulled back into place. The nitrile advanced asphalt latex held the seams together across that entire 100,000 square foot area with only minor repairs being needed. So the applicator completed a smoke test as per our specifications to ensure the vapor barrier still met installation requirements. But using a vapor barrier that uses the nitrile advanced asphalt latex over a generic asphalt latex or a taped vapor barrier system saved what would have been significant delays and additional costs to the project. So the last topic I'll mention when it comes to construction considerations when installing a vapor barrier is a product, using a product that requires a certified installation process, which includes certified installers, proper QA, Q, QA, QC procedures, which I've touched on, adequate inspection requirements, and various warranty options. In our experience, having an applicator that has decades of experience installing vapor barriers is critically important to a successful project. We've really seen time and time again that working on an active construction site introduces just too many variables that can disrupt the installation of the vapor barrier. Therefore, Land Science has a network of certified installers that are experienced and trained to install all of Land Science vapor barriers and can quickly troubleshoot any potential infield issues. In addition, we provide resources to consulting engineers that want to conduct third party inspections. Also, our applicators will complete thickness verifications of the vapor barrier during installation to ensure it meets our specifications, while also completing smoke testing 
on uh, every vapor barrier installation that we conduct. So I'm going to pivot to a to a case study um, that I think highlights some of the topics I just discussed with respect to constructability and installation of vapor barrier systems. So this site is located in Midtown Atlanta, Georgia, which is just about three miles north of downtown. The site had known industrial tenants operating on the property since I think the early 90s. So there was certainly a concern for potential vapor intrusion if the site was redeveloped. A nationally recognized housing developer saw an opportunity to provide luxury homes to the ever expanding housing market in Atlanta. And so this development included nine buildings in total, with, with each footprint averaging between four and 6,000 square feet. So by taking this property through the Georgia Brownfield program, the developer would be able to recoup some of the costs associated with assessment and mitigation in the form of tax incentives. So the environmental engineer brought on a consultant that specializes in vapor intrusion sampling and analysis to aid in identifying the VI risk and developing a mitigation strategy. So as a result, a limited soil gas investigation was conducted in November of 2019, with total of 18 soil gas samples being collected. And the results of the samples identified the presence of both petroleum and chlorinated VOCs in all 18 samples. So based on the initial sampling results, five buildings had soil vapor concentrations that exceeded the screening levels set by Georgia EPD. And the other four footprints did not show exceedances, but based on their proximity to the locations with exceedances, it was really likely that the EPD would require some form of mitigation in all those areas. And as a result, the consultant presented two options to the developer. Proceed with a vapor mitigation strategy for the entire property, or try to further clarify the risk at the site, especially under the buildings without exceedances, to try to risk away the need for mitigation. The developer ultimately went with option number one as it allowed them to proceed with construction much quicker. And option two actually didn't offer a guarantee that mitigation would not be needed after spending that additional time and money completing the investigations. So as I touched on earlier, building type can influence the vapor barrier selection process. On this site, there were going to be several thickened slab areas and footers, elevation changes requiring split wall foundations, concrete piers, and a cluster of utility penetrations. So this residential development had several elements that are common in residential applications that made a composite spray applied membrane a practical approach uh, for mitigation on this site. So the solution was a tailored vapor mitigation design for the site. For the four buildings with low to moderate level VI risk, a passive low profile vapor collection system with a nit nitro seal vapor barrier was installed. And at the higher risk buildings, an active subslab depressurization system in conjunction with the nitro seal vapor barrier was installed. So all buildings on the property would have test ports placed underneath the uh, foundation to run laterally for sampling outside the building footprint for O&M purposes. Here's a look at the passive vapor mitigation design for one of the building footprints. Each residential unit within the overall building footprint had the TerraVent low profile vent system installed with two vent risers. Once the venting system was installed, the nitro seal vapor barrier system was installed. And this system is comprised of a 10 mil HDPE sheet, which is thermally bonded to a geotextile fabric, a 40 mil application of the nitrile advanced asphalt latex, and then another HDPE geotextile top layer. Here's a look at the nitro seal membrane application across the building foundations. So the nitro base layer was rolled out and placed. Then nitro core was sprayed at 60 mil thickness in between the seams and around the utility conduits, followed by a 40 mil application of nitro core across the entire building footprint. So to date, the vapor mitigation system has been installed at two of the nine buildings. There is an O&M plan in place that has been submitted to the Georgia Brownfield team for review. 
to monitor the performance of the passive and active mitigation systems on the property. The developer will qualify for tax incentives upon building construction, and most importantly, the future residents of these townhomes will be protected from varying levels of risk across the site. So I'll end with a few takeaways. Like I said earlier, time is money. So the infield installation can make or break a project. We've seen numerous projects run into significant delays because the vapor barrier couldn't keep up with the construction schedule. Also consider all aspects of the construction process, rebar placement, other trades working around the barrier, the concrete pour. All these things will happen on or near the vapor barrier, whether you like it or not. You really should have a vapor barrier that will hold up to that level of activity. And finally, a certified installation can go a really long way in reducing long-term liability by providing proper QA, QC during the installation. So with that, I'm finished. I think Scott and I will stick around for a, a couple of questions. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. That concludes the formal section of our presentation. So at this point, we'd like to shift into the Q&A portion of the webcast, as Ryan mentioned. Before we do this, just a couple of quick reminders. First, you will receive a follow-up email with a brief survey. We really appreciate your feedback, so please take a minute to let us know how we did. Also, after the webinar, you will receive a link to the recording as soon as it is available. All right, so let's circle back to the question. Uh, if we're unable to get to your question, uh, we will make an effort to follow up with you after the webinar. All right, so here's a question for Ryan. And the question is, what is the cost per square foot for the new land science vapor, vapor barriers? Yeah, so with respect to cost, um, you know, for MonoShield, if you're familiar with cost of a typical 20 mil tape system, MonoShield will be certainly in line with those products. Uh, I'll say the real savings will come on the installation side because we can install the vapor barrier that much quicker. Uh, for Terrace Shield and Nitro Seal, our composite vapor barrier systems, the cost is going to be very similar to other composite vapor barriers that are on the market, except you're getting a much better system. So essentially, costs are remaining somewhat constant, but the technology is getting that much better with these new systems. All right, thanks, Ryan. Here is a question for Scott. And the question is, you're saying these barriers are true contaminant vapor barriers. What about projects that will have nuisance groundwater concerns or water at the elevator pits? Can these new barriers also act as waterproofing materials in these cases? Yeah, the, the answer is yes. It, these can act as waterproofing barriers as well. Uh, and uh, we have a warranty program uh, for waterproofing uh, as such. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, Scott. So here's another question. And the question is for Ryan. And it is, what types of sites is TerraShield recommended for? Yeah, so there's probably a couple different ways to answer this question. But TerraShield has, I'll say, has already been installed at numerous project sites with a wide range of contaminants at very high concentration. So as Scott pointed out earlier, TerraShield is really the premier vapor barrier from a chemical resistance standpoint. So TerraShield will really be protective against almost all contaminant concentrations. So um, you know, I'll say almost any site you have, TerraShield is going to be a really good option, uh, but we're happy to review any site specific information or data you might have. Okay, so here's another question for Scott. Um, this person is saying, I've used GeoSeal on sites before. Will you honor the warranty on these sites? Absolutely. Uh, you know, again, GeoSeal in the past was state of the art. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we supplied those products and we'll stand by the warranty for them. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Scott. Looks like um, we have a uh, Another question here, and this is for Ryan, and it is, uh, do the new vapor barrier technologies have regulatory approval? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we've installed all three technologies, TerraShield, NitroSeal, and MonoShield in numerous states across the country. So New Jersey, Michigan, Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Georgia, um, just kind of to name a few. So they've all received some type of approval. So yeah, regulatory agencies have certainly approved all, all three technologies. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Ryan. So that's going to be the end of our chat questions. If we did not get to your questions, someone will make an effort to follow up with you. If you'd like to learn more about vapor intrusion solutions from Land Science, please visit landsciencetech.com. Thanks again to Scott Wilson and Ryan Miller, and thanks to everyone who could join us. Have a great day.